You ready? It's good to see everybody here today. Uh, I know there's some that are former alumnus here, and I see some fellow students of mine that attended with me. Uh, let me get that off. But first of all, I want to say how much and how wonderful it is for me to be here today. Uh, I want to thank Brother Clark, and I want to, want to thank the uh, faculty of MSOP. I want to thank the elders of Forest Hill for extending to me an invitation to speak here today. I really appreciate it. I deem it as an honor and a privilege. And uh, I want everybody to know how much I appreciate it and how good it is to see everybody. Words of the preacher, the son of Solomon, king of Jerusalem. So begins the book of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon. Solomon was chosen by God in infancy to be the next king of Israel after his father David. He was given everything that he needed for success. Uh, God blessed him with power, position, uh, prosperity, as well as wisdom. Yet, despite all these gifts that Solomon had, he still drifted away from God. He wrote in chapter 1, 13, he said, I applied my heart to seeking to search out wisdom in all that is done under heaven. The all that is done under heaven were worldly pursuits. He searched through pleasure. He searched through riches. He, he searched through every worldly source only nothing of eternal significance. But thankfully, thankfully, as he got older, he realized the error of his way, and he came back to God. And through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes as he reflected upon the lessons they had learned in life so that down through the ages, people won't make the same mistake that he did. Seek purpose in life apart from God. He concluded the grand purpose in life. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The word fear in this verse is used almost 300 times in, in the uh, Old Testament. Uh, it's used in relation, mainly with God and his relationship with the Israelites. The Hebrew definition of fear means reverence and respect, but we also get a strong connection to the word trembling. And we can see this in Hebrews 12, 28, where the Hebrew writer admonishes us to serve God with fear, uh, serve God with uh, awesome fear, serve God with fear and awe. I'm sorry. Serve God with fear and awe. And then the next verse, for our God is a consuming fire. So how did the Israelites show that they feared God? One word, obedience. Just like the purpose that uh, Solomon stated, fear God and keep his commandments. Many, many times in the Old Testament, the Israelites were cautioned by God to fear God and keep his commandments. To fear God and walk in his statutes to fear God and walk in all his ways. So how did the Israelites show that they feared God? It was through their obedience. God had a standard of behavior for his people. He expected obedience. But we live in a day and time when most of the religious world do not agree with uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, mainly those of the Calvinistic persuasion. This uh, slide I have up here is uh, from Sam Morris. He's a Baptist preacher. And you notice what he says up there about all the prayers a man may pray and all the Bibles he may read, all the churches he may belong to, all the services he may attend, all the benevolent acts that he will perform will not make his soul one whit safer and all the sins he may commit from idolatry to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. 
He said the way a man lives has nothing to do whatsoever with the salvation of his soul. I mean, can you believe that? Is that what the Bible teaches? A scheme of redemption not based on the behavior of the believer. Well, we can learn the type of God that we serve by looking in the Old Testament. What's ever things were written for time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures may have hope. The Bible, the Old Testament is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Galatians 3.24. Well, just as God demanded obedience from the Israelites, he demands the same thing from us today. Today I'm going to be looking at three elements of biblical obedience. If we fear God and keep his commandments, our obedience to God will involve submission to the authority of his word. It will involve doing his will, and it will involve living faithful unto death. First, we're going to look at the fact that obedience to God involves submission to the authority of his word. And, one, and there are three reasons because of this. The first one is because his word is truth. And we heard some good sermons yesterday about truth. Uh, but one of the greatest tragedies of today is the cavalier attitude that most of the religious world have toward truth. I mean, they, they either act as if truth doesn't matter or they act as if truth doesn't exist, or at least not, not absolute truth anyway. Well the, well, the God who made everything and the same God who knows everything and the same God who has a purpose for everything, he has spoken to us through his word. He has spoken to us through his word. Said in John 17, 17, as he was praying in the garden and referencing his apostles, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 18, 37, Jesus stated that the reason that he came into this world was to bear witness to the truth. And he said, Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. In John 10, Jesus gives an illustration to demonstrate this truth here. In John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he wants his sheep to follow his voice. Now, back then, the shepherds would put all their sheep into a sheep pen, so all the different sheep would be mixed up, and all the shepherd had to do was to walk by and open the gate and call his sheep, and only his sheep, would come out. Well, that's what Jesus is alluding to in John 10, 27, when he says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So if we are of the truth, we will hear Jesus' voice, and we will submit to the authority of God's word, which is the absolute standard of spiritual truth that applies to everyone equally. I mean, we understand this in the physical world. I know Brother Kane yesterday gave some good illustrations about this, but in the physical world, we have measurements, weights and measurements. I mean, we all agree that 16 ounces equals a pound and 12 inches equals a foot. I mean, 100 pennies equals a dollar. I mean, this applies to everyone, to you and to me, to Baptists, to Methodists, Catholics. This applies to everybody alike. It's consistent and constant. But, as I said before, we live in a day and age where people do not agree that there's spiritual truth that applies to everyone equally. I was looking at the statistics Brother Cain had yesterday, and I combined two of them, and 70% in the religious world, either they do not believe in, in absolute truth or they do not believe it matters. And whether they realize it or not, they do not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Because when you think about it, a lot of these 70%, they have accepted Jesus in their heart, and they have said this in a prayer. And they're going around thinking they're saved. But Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Jesus is the truth. John 1, 14, Jesus is the word personified. In John 8, 31 and 32, he tells us if we continue in his word, then we can know the truth and the truth will set us free. But these people that do not believe in absolute truth do not believe in the Jesus of the Bible because Jesus is the truth. Unfortunately, many rely on creeds, manuals, articles of faith, and many rely on feelings. Probably a, a large portion uh, rely on their feelings. When we look in Jeremiah 13, starting at verse 10, Jeremiah was talking about Israel, said they were an evil people. And the reason why he said that, he said that they, instead of following God's word, they were following after the imagination of their hearts. When we look in the New King James Version, that, that verse is uh, translated, they were following the dictates of their hearts. And as I said before, that's the problem with so many in the religious world today. They follow the dictates of their hearts. We all have emotions, but we cannot use our emotions to move us away from the authority of God's word. Second, secondly, we submit to his word because his word is inspired. His word is inspired. And that comes from 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Of course, that phrase, given by the inspiration of God, means God breathed. God breathed. So the Bible is the actual breath of God. Every single word of the Bible is the breath of God. And I can't think of a, a more perfect way to establish the Bible as the authority of truth because it is God's breath. Nobody doubts God. Everybody believes in God. I want to look at two types of inspiration. I want to look at verbal inspiration. I want to go back to 2 Timothy 3, 16. It starts out, all scripture. Well, that word scripture in the Greek means to write, which means each and every word that is written was given by the inspiration of God, each and every word. This is also further confirmed by the fact that Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 1, 9, he said, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Every word is verbally inspired. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. The word of God is verbally inspired. We also see it in 2 Peter 1, 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Every word of God is verbally inspired. Next slide, I want to talk about plenary uh, inspiration. Plenary, of course, is described as full in all respects and complete. Uh, we get this from 2 Timothy 3.17, where it says all scriptures thoroughly furnishes us for every good work. And as we read Jude 1, 3, we must earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Of course, that is the King James Version. Uh, the New King James, uh, the American Standard Version, has this translated well, once and for all delivered unto the saints. And the New American Standard, Standard translates it once and for all time given into the saints. So this is really uh, a better translation. The truth was once and for all time given to us. God's word is complete. We don't need any further revelations. The third reason we submit to the authority of God's word is because he's gonna judge us. He's gonna judge us. We see this in John 12:48. He that rejects me or receives not my word has one to judge him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Read in uh, 2 Timothy 
If we're going to fear God and keep his commandments, not only are we going to submit to the authority of his word, we're going to have to do his will. We're going to have to do his will. Jesus stated in John 7, uh, 21, he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. Only those who do the will of the Father will enter heaven. Let's look at the definition of obedience here. The most common word in the Old Testament for obedience is the Hebrew word shama, which means hearing and obeying. It carries uh, with it, obedience is the only sure method of listening. So sometimes this word shama is translated here as in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Let's look in the New Testament. The Greek word for obedience, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that. BJ might tell me I mispronounce it. <laughs> it means to hear so as to do. I mean, we see that from James 1.22. Be ye, hearers of, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. Hearing, I think everyone in this room would agree, is the forgotten step of, of the plan of salvation in the religious world. I mean, they leave it out. They leave it out. Denominations talk about, I mean, do they talk about the importance of hearing God's word? No, they don't. They, they teach that because of our depraved, sinful nature, we cannot respond to God's word. So what good would be hearing if we're in our depraved state? Well, the Bible does not teach that. Over and over, we see in the New Testament that Christianity is a taught religion. Paul stated faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So according to the, to the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit, we can only attain faith through a hearing or a teaching of God's word. Now Jesus often stressed the importance of hearing in his word. He stated six times in the Gospels, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, Luke stated in his gospel, what Jesus stated, take heed how you hear, Luke 8, 18. And then Mark recorded that Jesus stated, take heed what you hear. So we can understand God's will. That's what Ephesians 5, 17 says. Be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I mean, if we can't understand it, why is the Holy Spirit telling us to understand what the will of the Lord is? In Matthew 15, 10, Jesus emphasized the importance of both hearing and understanding when he said, and he called the multitude unto them and said, hear and understand. So it's our responsibility to learn God's will, to learn what God wants us to do. Our obedience to God involves doing his will. Let's look at some examples of those who failed to do God's will. First, in the Old Testament. Okay, King Saul. There are many instances of disobedience in the Old Testament. The ones I'm going to show you, there are instances of disobedience. It's going to show the consequences they received because of their disobedience. King Saul was directed by God to utterly destroy the Amalekites along with their flocks and herds. Of course, we know that King Saul failed to comply with God's command by sparing King Agag and the best of his animals. And his failure to submit to God resulted in him losing his kingdom. We look at Moses, from Numbers 20. Moses is in the desert of Zin. And the children of Israel are once again murmuring. They don't have enough water to drink. So God tells Moses to speak to the rock. But Moses smote the rock instead. And what happened to Moses? He was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu disobeyed. God's command by offering strange fire before the Lord. Now, Nadab and Abihu were the elder 
sons of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses. They were part of the Levitical priesthood. They were anointed priests, and they should have known better in their fire and their worship. But they offered strange fire, and what happened to them? God killed them, struck them dead. Let's look at some examples of obedience. Of course, there's a lot more than the ones I mentioned. We got Abraham in Hebrews in Genesis 12 and 22, two instances of Abraham's obedience. First, in Genesis 12:1, Abraham is told by God to get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. Well, Abraham obeyed. I mean, the question was, what do you have the faith necessary to leave the place he had ever known, to go to a place he'd never seen? Well, he did. According to the Hebrew writer, by faith Abraham, Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed to go to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went not knowing where he, was, where he went. Genesis 22, we read the second instance of uh, Abraham's obedience to God where Abraham commanded God to offer his son Isaac upon the altar. So when you read the account, Abraham with two servants and Isaac, they walked to the place God had appointed for, to, uh, for Abraham to offer his son. And right at, as Abraham was about to sacrifice his son, he raised his knife and the angel stopped his hand and commended him for his faith. The God of Abraham is the same God that we serve today. It's the God that expects us to obey his commands. I mean, you read in James 1, 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought by his works and work by works was his faith made perfect? That applies to us today. Let's look at the second example of biblical obedience in Noah. Of course, we're all familiar with the account of Noah found in Genesis 6 through 9. In Genesis 6, 8, we read that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, God decided to extend to Noah his grace by warning him of the impending flood and commanding him to build an ark. The Hebrew writer commended Noah for his faith when he wrote in Hebrews 11 and 7, by faith Noah being warned of God as things not yet seen, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Noah was saved by grace, but he was saved by an obedient faith. There was something Noah had to do. He had to build the ark. He had to build it out of gopher wood. He had to build it the way that God specified. Would Noah have been saved by the flood if he had not built the ark? No, he would not. Noah had to obey God, God by doing, his, doing what he commanded, thus doing his will. Let's look at the third example. We're going to look at Cornelius, Acts 10 and 11. Okay, in Acts 10, 6, 5 and 6, we read that an angel appears to Cornelius, tell, tell, tells Cornelius, send men to Joppa to find one surnamed Peter, Simon Peter, who will show you what you oughtest to do. I want you to hone in on that thou oughtest to do. The word oughtest in the Greek, according to the Strong's Concordance, means necessary, as binding, as must. It was something that Cornelius had to do. In Acts 10, 23, 22, uh, Peter questions the men whom Cornelius sent to him. Peter says, why are you here? In verse 22, they answer, Cornelius needs to hear words of thee, hear words from thee. We read in uh, the next chapter, verse 14, when Peter and the men finally make it to Cornelius' residence, Cornelius recounts his vision, tells them, he was to hear words whereby thou shalt be saved in all thy house. What words were Cornelius, 
commanded to do. We find that in Acts 10.48. Uh, 10, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now the word commanded, translated from a Greek word which means to arrange toward, and it carries with it the idea of prescribe, order, or to command something. In this case, Cornelius and his household were commanded to be baptized. Uh, it's a verb in the passive form, which means that God is the giver of commands, and we as his creation are the receiver of commands. So Peter was commanded by God to co go to Cornelius, tell him words whereby he and his household would be saved. If we fear God and keep his commandments, then our obedience will involve living faithful until death. Many times in Paul's writings, in following epistles, Paul used the metaphor, the, often used the metaphor of an athlete when describing a Christian, many times. He wrote in 2 Timothy 2.5, to compete in any competition, the athlete must compete by the rules. Likewise, we as Christians, in order to know that we must know the rules that God has given us so we can obtain the crown of life. Now, we're familiar with, with Paul's uh, illustrations of the Christian life as a race. I'm going to get to that. Christian life as a race. He wrote to the church in Galatia, he said, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? He said, you were running well. What, who hindered you? Some of the Galatian uh, saints had ceased obeying the truth. They had ceased running, according to Paul. The Apostle Paul liked to use the metaphor of a race referring to the Christian life. It's not a race of speed, it's a race of endurance. The Christian life is a marathon. You know, the Christians address in the book of Hebrews were those who had shown themselves to be very strong and dedicated at one point in, life, in their lives. But the Hebrew writer warned the Christians to whom he was addressing, here we go again and behind. He warned them, he said, you ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest any time we should let them slip. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Well, I thought I'd put that on there. We read in Revelation 2, 2, as we bring this lesson to a close, uh, that John wrote, to the church, uh, I know your works, your toil and patient endurance, how you cannot bear those who are evil. They had left their first love, according to Revelation 2.5. Uh, John, Jesus' revelation to the church at Ephesus has just as much significance for the church today as it is in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. Today's timeless uh, truth was fear God, keep his commandments. We saw that our obedience to God involves submission to his word, involves doing his will, and involves living faithful unto death. Brother John, that bell was to stop if you wanted to continue going. We still have a little bit more time unless that was... I didn't want you to be scared off by the bell. <laughs> no. No. Thank you very much.